Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to another one of our outdoor services. This is so nice. Our song selection is right over here on the board. Here I am to worship by faith and the heart of worship, in case you need that. Um, another announcement over in that corner is the uh, giving box where you can drop off your tithes and offerings. We thank you. Um, from there, why don't you stand, join us, and let's worship our God, because that's why we're here.
that's about to be read, you'll, you, you'll feel it in the words. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like a voice of great multitude and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of many peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. By faith, we've come here to worship. That's why we've come to corporately give our hearts to the Lord. But as we worship, it's, it's more than just that. It's more than just the music we sing. It's more than just praying before we eat a meal. It's, it's our lives. It's everything. It's about the heart of worship. Thank you. 
King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single You search much deeper within In the way things are clear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord may be seated. All right, everyone's seated. I want to make a quick announcement before we dive into the scripture. Um, thank you all so much for coming this morning. We've had, what, five, six beautiful mornings in a row? Something to be thankful for. Um, I've noticed also that people have been slowly shifting from over there to now we're, we're fully in the shade. So no more, no more sweating. Um, just a quick announcement. Um, we, we're not going to be having uh, VBS this year. So if VBS is something that you were excited about, just because um, I think there's just complications having it here. Um, keeping it on, on uh, campus, so to speak. Um, that being said, uh, Missy Everson is going to be doing a five-day club. It's going to be on April 10th to the 14th from 10 to 11.30. August. April was like, yeah. August. April was multiple months ago, just for those of you who weren't paying attention. Or planning ahead. Um yeah, so uh, August 10th to the 14th from 10 to 11.30. Um, so K through 6, boys and girls, anyone who would like to do that, um, it's going to be a five-day club. So if you have any questions about that, come to me or come to uh, Missy, and we will get some more information to you. Um, before we go any farther into this morning, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for... Uh, this beautiful morning. Thank you for um, bringing everyone here this morning. I, I just pray that as we as we dive into your word um, in a few moments, that you would just open our hearts, um, that you would humble us, and give us a heart of worship. It's so easy to be distracted by, uh, by the stuff going on at home. It's so easy to be distracted by the things that we're looking forward to later today. Um, I'm sure all of us have, have plans for this beautiful day, Lord, um, and we're thankful for that. But I would just pray that you would just open our hearts and minds and uh, that we would have a desire to hear what you have for us this morning and that you would just come come down on us in a new and different way and uh, just change us, make us to look more like you. Um, but Lord, we lift up those who are, are suffering, whether here or elsewhere, I pray that you would comfort them and uh, that everything that, that you do on this earth, everything that we do, um, would lead this world um, to look more like uh, the eternity that we have to look forward to. And, um, and that's a blessing. And thank you that you have allowed us to be part of that. So, Father, we thank you for your love for us who do not deserve it. In your name I pray. Amen.
Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to all the words of the king, who sent them to reproach the living God. Truly, O God, the king of Syria, have de devastated all the countries and their lands, and have cast their gods into fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men, men's hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from the hands that all kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Thank you. I was trying to pick a passage. I figured, what passage can I put the most complicated and difficult words into it? So... I decided to pick a, a passage with a guy's name. Back in those days, when they would name their kids, they would just take a bunch of letters in a bowl and just dump them out. And whatever came was what your name was. Um, so I was told that I had to, to tell a joke today. So I spent all week preparing this so that you guys can then say, our associate pastor preached last week. What a joke. You know, I'll never, I'm sorry, that was just the worst. I don't know, you probably missed it. So, uh, this morning I want to talk about two main things, and that is um, fear and prayer. Um, I always love opening, opening up um, discussions with God's Word by connecting them to um, either modern day events or references that, that we see on a daily basis, um, because... I think it's easy for us to, to read God's Word, to, to read narrative, to read stories, and to separate those, those from our, our lives, especially with, with narrative. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But one of my favorite pieces of literature, and I think I've referenced this, is The Lord of the Rings. I probably need to get some, some different references. But um, for those of you who are familiar with it, um, and for those of you who aren't, I will try to explain it simply. At the end of the third Third, third book, um, the good guys have all gathered together and they are going to attack the main bad guy. They've got an army together and they need to get the bad guy to fight against them. And so they, they bring their army to the Black Gates. Now thankfully in, in literature, in fantasy literature, the bad guys are all the ones that are like burnt and evil looking. Um, it, makes it, it makes good and evil easy to distinguish. So they're standing outside the Black Gates and not an army, not the bad guy himself, but a single man walks out. And this is the, this is the main bad guy's emissary. And the goal of, of, this, of this guy is called the Mouth of Sauron. His goal is to, to break the spirit, the courage, the hope of the good guys. He, he brings with him a, a, shirt, uh, a shirt that belongs to one of their friends. And, and essentially his goal is, guys... We're way more powerful than you are. We've already won. We've defeated you. Give up. I think in our lives, we face a lot of situations where we run into something, whether it's, it's danger or fearful circumstances on the outside of us or temptation within, that can do the same. That can tempt us to to want to give in. And today I want to ask the question, how should we respond when facing fearfulness from the outside or temptation within that are calling us and saying, you've lost, just, just give in. God's not there for you. And to do this, I want to keep this fairly simple. I'm going to give you a brief story. Liz, read the passage that we're going to be going. It's from Isaiah 37. I want to give the brief background to the story so you understand what brings the characters to this point, and then we're going to draw some conclusions from that, some applications. So, let's look at the prayer of Hezekiah. 
But before I do that, that is uh, Isaiah 37, verses uh, 15 through 20. But before I do that, I want to give some, some context to, to the story. Here's why. Who here has, uh, has ever read or seen the VeggieTales movies? I assume probably most of you. Okay. The VeggieTales movies are funny. They're great. But something that I think happens to us, at least in this culture, is when we read stories in the Bible, we become detached from them. We think either, oh, this is a great story. Oh, that's so cute. They killed all the people in the town. Um, or we don't think of them as real characters. We, we read about Jericho, and we, you picture a bunch of kids walking around singing, Joshua knocked down the walls of Jericho. Or you picture a bunch of tomatoes and celery hopping around a city with slushies being dropped on them. So you laugh, and that's funny, right? But how, how often do we, when we think of narrative in the Bible, do we think of real people who really suffered, who had real fears, who went to the bathroom. I, I tend to think of Bible stories as good old stories sometimes. Sometimes I picture them in the same way as veggie tales. And so I want to put this, this narrative that, that Liz read into a context so that you will see that these are serious events. These are real people who had real fears. So... In our story, King Hezekiah in Jerusalem is facing an enemy. His name is very long, so we will skip it. <laughs> but he's the king of Assyria, and they were essentially the world power of that time. Hezekiah thought, you know, I'm kind of bored, so I'm going to rebel against these people. And so he does. He rebels against the Assyrians, and they respond by bringing an army into Palestine, into Canaan. And he's capturing towns along the way. Um, there's one that is mentioned in, in the passage of Isaiah 36, actually. is uh, a town called Lachish, which I've actually been learning a lot about this week. This town is a heavily fortified city. He attacks it, breaks into it, and butchers everybody. Except for those that he takes into another country. And he was, the king of Assyria was so proud of this that he actually went home and drew pictures of this town, of this victory, in his palace. So, again, real people, real situations, real suffering, real fear. These are not fables. I recently had some, some friends express fear that has about the violence that has just been erupting in different places around our country. And while they were in a semi-safe location, they were afraid that the danger was going to come to them. In this circumstance, the danger has come to Hezekiah. It has come to the people of their city. And the same people who had executed the people of Lachish were now coming to Jerusalem and were going to do the same. Think about the fear. Those of you who are parents who have kids, imagine having kids knowing that your kids are going to die a horrible way or be shipped off, shipped off to be slaves someplace else. And then comes the spokesperson for the king. I'm going to read just a few verses. This guy comes to Hezekiah and he, he yells out across the walls of the city for everyone to hear. He's speaking to the king. Um, he's also speaking to the people. He wants to break their hope. And there's three things, I think, that, that we can find that he, he says. This is going to be in Isaiah 36, if you would like to follow along. Again, we're still just in the background. First, in verses 14 and 15, he questions God's hope of deliverance. He says, Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he's not going to be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. In other words, he says, You guys think your king's going to be able to defeat me? You think your God is going to be able to protect you? Ha! We're way stronger than you. We're way stronger than your king. Don't count on it. We're going to win. 
He questions whether God is going to be able to deliver them. Then he suggests reward if they compromise and give in. Look at verses 16 and 17. He nicely divided this up into two two verse sections, which I appreciate. Do not listen to the king Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, If you make peace with me and come out, then each one of you will eat his own vine and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. So he says, folks, if you... All you have to do is just open the gates, come on out, and I'll give you everything you want. If they compromise, if they give in, if they don't trust in their God, um, he says, I'll give you all of this stuff. And then he again proclaims God's failure by listing all the other gods that have failed. Have any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Um, have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all of the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? So he lists all these other places and he says, literally all of these people have failed. This is the first use of the word literally in the Bible. He says, literally everybody that we've gone against has failed. And you're going to be next. You're going to be next. I think we see these same lies, or these same things spoken to us regularly. Sometimes our hope is tested. Is God truly enough? Does God care about you? Does he see what's going on? Is he going to deliver you from pain or suffering? Is he strong enough to get you out of a situation? Or sometimes, just, is he there? Our hope is tested, because without hope, we will give in to anything. But then our, our, our resolve, it can be tested. How easy would it be for me to just give in and just gossip one more time? How easy would it be for me to just become angry? Oh, just one nasty social media post. I'm tired. I'm grumpy. Do I really need to be kind to my children? It's okay if I give in to paralyzing worry this time. Because it's going to happen anyways. And if I give in, then the attack will stop. Um, all of us have uh, weaknesses in our lives. And I would like to share one of mine. I say one of mine because sometimes my weaknesses can be like a CVS receipt. Um... You know, you go in there to buy a stick of gum and the receipt's like, boosh! You know, you're like, I just wanted a piece of gum. I didn't want, like, Declaration of Independence. But one of my weaknesses is um, gummy bears. So, obviously gummy bears aren't the most healthy thing you can eat. But recently, I had been doing very well eating healthy that day. And... A friend of mine happened to have some gummy bears. And this friend realized my expression and said, You want these? I know you want them. And I persisted for hours, days, months of strong resistance. But the fact was that my resolve had been broken. <laughs> but the thought was, if I just give in to these gummy bears, then I get these delicious, you know, they're all these colors. Like, what else would you want? And the temptation was, if you give in, you get this candy. And in that moment, I'm not thinking about how it's going to make my teeth feel. I'm not thinking about, you know, how much farther I have to run afterward. I'm just thinking about gummy bears. And I think that's what 
fear and danger and temptation does to us is it says, hey, you're grumpy. You worked hard today. Just tell your kids to watch TV. Your husband and your wife, they can, they'll deal with it. They'll be fine. Everyone else is talking about this person, so it's okay to do it too. And um, our resolve to, to, to stay strong is tested. Um, but lastly, our, our memory, or lack thereof, is, is questioned. How quickly do we forget God's faithfulness? How quickly do we forget those moments? Have you ever had moments where you just sit there and you feel satisfied? You feel full? When you can just look around at the beauty around you and be content and be filled with joy. How often do we forget those moments when, when danger or fear or temptation comes upon us? Or how, how, how about how many times have we failed in the past so just another time isn't going to make that much of a difference? Just like this spokesperson of the king of Assyria comes and questions the people of Israel on the walls, so often I think we face similar questions today. So the question then that we've got to ask is, how did Hezekiah respond so that we can know how to respond? How does Hezekiah respond? And then hopefully we can respond in a similar way. And now we come to Isaiah 37, 15 through 20. Hezekiah's first response, his first response is to take his fear, to take the problem, and present it before the Lord. Verse 14 of 37 says, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers. He read it. He sees the problem. He's not taking it. He's not sloughing it off. He's taking it seriously. He understands the danger. And he immediately goes up to the house of the Lord and puts it before God. What is your first response to temptation or to fear? Hezekiah could have, could have had an epic defend the walls moment where there's epic music playing and he's galloping around arming the soldiers, leading them to the walls. Um, that's the way it happens in movies, right? Um, the problem is, is that the other city did that they had their epic defend the walls moment and they all got killed. How do we respond? What is our first, our initial thought when facing temptation, fear? Uh, when, you, when you hear bad stuff, uh, scary stuff on the news, do you go and put it to God in prayer or do you go and run and write something on social media? When you face temptation, do you take it to God in prayer, say, God, let's, let's, let's win here, let's respond correctly? Or do you think, oh, I've lost? Hezekiah could have strengthened his belt and armed his, his soldiers, um, but he realized his only hope was through God's deliverance. And that requires faith. That requires faith in God's promises before that requires faith that, that the God that has been gracious to him, to us in the past, will continue to do so now. So Hezekiah's first response is to take all of that and put it to God in prayer. Um, but secondly, his, his prayer shows that he has a right view of God. I think I would argue that many of our, our struggles in life um, come because we have a wrong view of God. If we view God incorrectly, we will then respond incorrectly to difficulty. Let me read verses 15 through 17. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, 
which he has sent to mock the living God. Hezekiah runs to God, and he knows the person to whom he is speaking. He realizes that God is powerful and holy. He says, God, this isn't a surprise to you. You're not up there freaking out, trying to figure out what to do. You were above all of this. This isn't difficult for you. This isn't scary for you. You see everything. You are so high above all of my problems, all of our, my struggles, my fears. But also then he says, Lord, listen. Hear what is going on. See our fears. See what is being said. He realizes that God is not only powerful, he's way above us, but he's also caring. Thank you. I can chill the wind. He realizes that, that God, not only is he so far greater than us, but also he cares about our individual daily lives. Mark has talked about him being intimate. And I think sometimes that is a part of God that we struggle to remember. That the creator of the universe who made planets, who made all of us, also cares very deeply about the daily things that go on in your lives. So, how does Hezekiah have a correct view of God? And therefore, then how can we? Um, one, he knew God's word. Obviously, he didn't have the whole Bible. He didn't have the New Testament. But he knew God's word. 2 Kings 18.6 says this. For he clung to the Lord. Speaking of Hezekiah, he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had given to Moses. This word cling is, is interesting. Um, I was talking about John 15 with a friend, with an Arabic speaking friend several months ago. And he tried to translate John 15. And for the word abide, John 15 is a passage that says, Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. It's all about clinging to the branch. And in his translation from, from like I guess he was using Google Translate, the word abide, he used the word cling. And the idea is not that Hezekiah went to church every Sunday necessarily, not that he was the perfect person, but rather he said, God, keep me close to you. Fill me. He abided in relationship with him and obeyed. That can be boring. But it left Hezekiah with a knowledge of God that allowed him to respond correctly in the moment of difficulty. There's no, nothing exciting about abiding, about clinging, but it's something that, that gave him a right view of God. Something that I don't have many times, and I think many of us do not have a lot. And if he didn't, he would not have had the faith to respond the way that he did. So not only did he first take his, his fear to God as his first response, not only does his prayer show that he has a right view of God, but his, fair, his prayer shows a lack of confidence in man, rather a confidence in God's deliverance. Um, verse 18 Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to all the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. But they were no gods, but the works of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they are destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Hezekiah says, these people have broken everybody. And they had. Very powerful. They defeated Israel. They had defeated Syria. They had defeated the Philistines. All of these characters in the Bible, the Assyrians had defeated. 
And he says, but God, their gods aren't real. Their gods are just lumps of wood and stone. You are different. What do you think would happen if we responded to our failures like Hezekiah? said, God, I, I've failed you many times. That was wrong. I've responded in evil ways before. I've given in to fear many times. But that was because I thought that I could be tough enough. I thought I could be strong enough to do this. You have never failed me. What would happen if, if instead of getting discouraged by failure, we realized the, the cause of our failure? And then he asks for help. Our culture is a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps culture. And that sounds great, but I think that is somewhat antithetical to what God wants from us. Asking for help can be seen as weakness, but I think God wants us to ask for help. He wants us to cry for salvation, for deliverance. So when we're in the midst of these moments, how often do we cry out to God for help? It's like, God, this is scary. I don't know what to do here. God, this seems so powerful in my life. What do I do? How, I don't know how to, to beat this. Please deliver me. Lord, I'm just grumpy every day when I go into work. And I'm hurting people. Deliver me. Change my heart. Lord, life is scary. I'm afraid of what's going on around me. Please deliver me and give me peace. So, how does the story end? We actually have three sources documenting this. So again, I want to remind you, real people, real circumstances, real fears, real prayers. The sources differ because a lot of history was propaganda back then. What we do know is that this powerful enemy, the Assyrians, who were on the doorsteps of Jerusalem, suddenly turn around and are gone. Jerusalem doesn't get destroyed. Jerusalem doesn't get conquered. They're just gone. They went back home. Hezekiah looked to God for deliverance, and... And it came. There was no siege. There was no epic moment where Hezekiah is on the walls killing enemies left and right. God saved them. I'm going to share a brief story when I was just a young lad, uh, maybe five or six. And the story begins like every good story should begin with. With, with a balloon. So I had this balloon. I don't remember where I got it. But I was proud of my balloon. And I would play this game. Where I would hold the balloon with two hands. And I'd let go. And I'd catch it before it would go up into the sky. Unfortunately this is the same young lad. That bought a glove and a baseball. Threw it up and forgot to raise the glove. And the ball came down and hit him in the face. So this, this, this boy was playing with his balloon out in the backyard, and he let it go and missed it. And the balloon, the balloon went up into the air, obviously. He didn't go get a ladder. He didn't try to climb the tree. He screeched. And the screech wasn't a, a cry of fear. It was a cry of help, because... Um, I still remember this. Um, I'm switching from third to first person, which is just you're not supposed to do that. Um, my my dad was in the in the backyard working on you know stuff that dads do, and I screeched because I knew that my balloon was gone unless my dad could go and retrieve it. And um, he actually told me that night that he had gone out and rented a big uh, cherry picker a big like thing that it would lift up a bucket way up in the sky and and he searched this very similar yes he searched the skies for my balloon and couldn't find it um i only realized many years later that it was a load of baloney but <laughs> here's the thing 
my view of him impacted how I responded. I understood that good fathers care for their children. And how we view God will, res- will impact how we respond to him in times of trouble, in times of difficulty. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, um, the God that delivered Hezekiah is now the God that is your father. And good fathers care for their children. Uh, if this morning you don't know what that means, you don't know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, or you would like to know more, by all means, please talk to me afterward. I would love to, to share that with you. We've got to have a right view of, of God. So, nuts and bolts. How does that happen? We've got to know who he is and what he says. We've got to know God's word. Again, it seems very mundane, but it's uh, incredibly important. And we've got to spend time talking to him. A relationship where either neither people talk to each other or one person just does all the talking is not going to last very long. Ultimately, we need to abide, to cling to him in relationship. Hezekiah clung to God He kept close to him, and he responded in the moment of of trouble correctly. So when facing a powerful enemy, how should we respond? That's the question from the beginning. How should we respond? We've got to respond by clinging to Jesus now. And then in the moment of, of fear, in the moment of temptation, in the moment of, of, of danger, resting in him to deliver us. So when you see the, the dangerous world around you and you are filled with fear, when there are circumstances in your life that bring pain, put those fears before Jesus and stick close to him. It's not going to fix your problems, maybe. You probably won't have the army of Assyria march away from you. But whatever happens, you can know that that you have have put that before his hands and he cares about you. When you see temptation showing up in your life and you see yourself consistently responding, hurting people, responding in ways that are are unchristlike, rather than being discouraged and supposing that its power is way too much for you, run to Christ and watch him deliver you. Um, Hezekiah saw a powerful enemy, an over unbeatable enemy, but he responded in faith. Because he knew, like we can know, that good fathers care for their children. So let's respond when we're in the midst of those difficulties to God as a good father. Paul Gardner, could you close us, please, sir? I want to use Acts, the fourth chapter, as my benediction this morning. You can read the entire thing at home. For now, I'll just summarize. Peter and John had healed a lame man. They went up into the temple to to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a matter of weeks after Christ had been crucified in this city. Just weeks. And they preached about the resurrected Christ, and people were responding very well to that. The religious leaders arrested him, put him in prison. Note this as you read chapter 4. Overnight, while Peter and John were in prison, the church grew by about 2,000 people. The the Sanhedrin brought them out the next morning and questioned them as to what authority they used to heal this man 
and what authority they were claiming for the message that they were presenting. And they preached the gospel to the religious leaders. The religious leaders didn't know what to do with them, so they released them. And Peter and John went to the believers. See, we're, we're in a time of unprecedented for us, not for mankind, but for us, unprecedented fear and discombobulation to our lives and our jobs and our homes and our work as a church. Peter and John are facing severe, dangerous opposition. So they're released, they go to the believers and worship God. And this is the benediction I want to share with you. Because when we're facing those kinds of circumstances, as Nate was talking about this morning, what do we do? Do we retreat? Does our witness for Christ become silent? Do we pray that our enemies will be destroyed or at least uh, neutered? Here's what the disciples prayed. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, so much for your word. We thank you especially this morning for the word become flesh. And as we're in this time of fear and being unsettled, concerns every time we turn on the news, I just pray that you will help us to resolve anew, to speak your word with boldness. In Jesus' name, amen.